This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. Televangelist Pat Robertson's outspoken opinions have often made him the target of criticism. But in 1990, Robertson was targeted for violence delivered through the mail. Authorities believe the bomber has struck before and fear that he will strike again. As a teenager, Kathy Williams suffered years of physical and emotional abuse inflicted by her stepfather, a policeman. When Kathy went to the authorities, she found herself victimized again and unjustly committed to reform school. In July of 1990, Beverly McGowan of Boca Raton, Florida, placed an ad for a roommate which was answered by a mysterious woman known only as Alice. One week later, Beverly's mutilated body was found in a drainage canal 100 miles away. For every mystery, there is someone, somewhere, who knows the truth. Perhaps that someone is watching. Perhaps it's you. Join me. thing is so important. They're one flesh. God said, I hate divorce. Televangelist this is, this Pat Robertson's daily broadcasts over CBN, the Christian Broadcasting Network, are seen in nearly a million households nationwide. But his outspoken stance on controversial issues has often made That's him the, the target of hate mail and death threats. Of what this does to society. Robertson's broadcasts originate from his 693-acre headquarters in Virginia Beach, Virginia, each day, more than 6,000 letters and parcels pour into the CBN mailroom, most of them donations from devoted viewers. Because of the controversy generated by Robertson's opinions, any package which appears even mildly suspicious is run through an X-ray machine. On April 27, 1990, Scott Sheepers, a CBN security guard, was called to the mailroom to check a package addressed personally to Pat Robertson. No one else was in the area at the time. When I looked at the package on the monitor of the x-ray machine, um, I didn't see anything that was that led me to believe that it was there was a problem or it was really suspicious. Sheepers remained on guard and decided to check the contents of the package. He was baffled by several strips of newspaper sticking out of the box. I was still somewhat skeptical about it, um, so I, I stepped away from the box as far as I could get and took my left hand and extended it out and grabbed the lid of the box. I was immediately knocked to the floor. Um, I had severe pain in the upper part of my left leg, in my abdomen, over to my right leg. I made the determination that this is it. You know, it's either lay here and possibly die or get up and get help. And uh, so that's when I made the determination to help myself and pick myself off the floor and try to get to the front of the building. Sheepers was rushed to a nearby hospital where he underwent emergency surgery to remove the shrapnel embedded in his leg. I'm very fortunate 
the trauma room doctor said if I'd have been holding the package and I had the same size hole in my chest that I have in my leg, um, I might not have even made it out of the room itself. So, uh, yeah, I consider myself very, very fortunate that it wasn't any worse than it was. Postal inspectors and agents for the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms determined that the package contained a homemade pipe bomb. They quickly linked the bomb to an earlier attack aimed at another televangelist in Texas. This man, Jesus. In 1960, John Pastor John Osteen founded the Lakewood Church in Houston. With 8,200 seats, Lakewood is one of the largest churches in America. Peter, who is this? He said to Jesus, thou art the Christ, the Son Like of Robertson, the Pastor Osteen uses television to spread the gospel. The but demons. unlike Robertson, Mark he does not five. ask for Mark donations on the air. Mark chapter five, who is this? You demons, speak. The Lakewood Church is a family-run organization. Osteen's wife, Dodie, serves as co-pastor, and four of their six children are involved in church activities. Amen, and everybody said amen. On January 30th, 1990, three months before the CBN bombing, Osteen's daughter, Lisa, arrived in her office to open the day's mail. I noticed uh, a box, and I picked it up, and it was very heavy. It's a little unusual and different. I felt like it was safe to open the package because I, I opened a lot of packages as we've never had any problems. And this looked like an ordinary package. It had a, a label uh, addressed to my dad, type written to my dad, and then it had a return address. And you know, you don't, you're not really suspicious of things like that. It was just a cardboard box and it had a, one piece of tape on it. When I opened the package, I remember this great explosion, and it shook my body. And I, I didn't lose consciousness, but there was a time uh, I opened the box when I was sitting down, and really the next thing I remember is I was standing about five feet away from my chair, and I was very shaken as if I'd had an electrical shock. I'll never forget that feeling. Lisa had been the victim of a pipe bomb wrapped in newspaper. She suffered third-degree burns and lacerations on her right leg and abdomen. She recovered from her injuries and just four weeks later returned to the pulpit. I said, I'm alive and well, thank God. Thank God. The box that was used to, to mail this, this device was a box used by home, home sales distributors for the distribution of candles and there was some printed material on the outside of the box which had been scratched out with the word burgundy written on the box. We found that both of these packages were mailed from small towns near Fayetteville, North Carolina. The National Center for the Analysis of Violent Crimes researched all the evidence in both the bombing cases. To accompany their, her husband to a they said, number one, that this individual responsible for the bombings had some type of stress or turmoil in his life at the time of the bombings. Secondly, they felt that anyone around or in the presence of the bomber would have known a, a difference in this person's behavior. If I could talk to the man that sent the bomb to me, I think I would just say that I wish you would give yourself up and receive help because, you know, I was just an innocent victim. You sent that bomb to me. You hurt me. I have scars on my body. You could have killed me. And it's not right for an innocent victim, to, for that to happen to an innocent victim. I would like to see him caught. I don't have any real tremendous amount of hate or animosity for him. Uh, he needs help. Um, he's hurt several people, and uh, I'd like to see him taken off the street, you know, before he kills somebody else, or kills somebody. 
These two composites depict the men who were seen mailing the bombs. The drawings are made three months apart by two different police artists, but authorities are convinced they portray the same individual. He is described as a neatly dressed white male with brown hair. He is between 28 and 35 years old, about 5 feet 11 inches tall, with average build. He weighs between 160 and 175 pounds. The bombs are mailed from Bladenboro in Elizabethtown, North Carolina. Both are small towns within 25 miles of Fayetteville. Fortunately, there have been no other incidents since the CBN bombing in 1990. However, authorities fear the bomber may strike again. Next, a young mother convicted of murder wins her final appeal. Tonight, a very special update. Thanks in part to our broadcast, a young mother unjustly accused of murdering her child has been freed. July 9th, 1989, St. Louis, Missouri. Patty Stallings rushed her critically ill son to the hospital. Brian Stallings was three months old, and since birth, he had suffered from chronic gastric distress. But this day, the diagnosis was shocking. Brian had apparently been poisoned with ethylene glycol, a substance found in antifreeze. Just have to ask you a few questions, if you could come in for a moment. Sure. Police were called to the hospital to interrogate Ryan's parents. We were split up and talked to by detectives. They were saying that they knew that that baby had been poisoned by either me or my husband. And I, I was just, I was devastated. I was blown away. I just could not believe that they could even think. I mean, Ryan was my world. While the investigation was in progress, Patty and David Stallings' contact with Ryan was restricted to a one-hour visit each week. During the sixth visit, Patty was left alone with Ryan for a short time. Four days later, Ryan would suffer another severe attack of vomiting. The diagnosis again was poisoning. After just 72 hours, Ryan Stallings died. On September 17, 1989, Patty Stallings, who did not yet know she was pregnant again, was charged with first-degree murder and held without bail. She was not allowed to attend her son's funeral. On February 27, 1990, while Patty was in jail awaiting trial, her second son, DJ, was born. When DJ was two weeks old, he began to exhibit symptoms identical to the ones that had plagued his brother, Ryan. This time, the ailment was diagnosed as a rare genetic disorder Methylmalonic acidemia, or MMA. Its symptoms are often confused with ethylene glycol poisoning. Despite DJ's diagnosis, Patty Stallings was convicted and sentenced to life in prison for the murder of her son, Ryan. DJ was placed in the custody of the state, and Patty was allowed to see him only three times. I've lost one child to MMA. My second child is stricken with MMA and may not live. He's a year old now, and they're still not sure how to treat him. I lost my freedom. I've lost everything. On the night this story aired, calls from physicians familiar with MMA poured into our telecenter. Patty Stallings' new attorneys petitioned the court to grant her another trial based on the fact that she had previously received ineffectual counsel. On July 30th, 1991, Patty Stallings was granted a new trial and released from prison. After the Unsolved Mysteries aired, people were writing and calling and just wanting to know, how can we help? And I can't thank those people enough because, I mean, through all of that, wheels started turning and everything just started pushing forward really fast. Along with Ryan's remaining serum On September 20th, 1991, a press conference was held in St. Louis. 
Dr. Piero Ronaldo of Yale University revealed that independent serum tests showed Ryan Stallings had definitely died of MMA. Consequently, the prosecuting attorney dropped all charges against Patty Stallings. Unfortunately, we can't undo the suffering that the Stallings have endured during this entire ordeal. And I apologize to them both personally and for the state of Missouri. During the press conference, Patty and David heard for the first time that custody of their son, DJ, had been returned to them. In October of 1991, just over two years after his brother's death, DJ came home for the first time. Just want to make up for the year and a half that we didn't have him, and it's hard to make up that much time, but. I'm doing the best I can. <laughs> His condition is very scary, but we've tackled so many hard things that you know we've just kind of said we'll we'll beat this too. And with that attitude, I know that DJ will do all right and that we'll do okay. He is a miracle <laughs> child, and we're lucky to have DJ. And we have our whole life back. It's like we're starting over. It's indescribably. Wonderful. We have all met people who have made lasting impressions upon us. Sometimes they are total strangers who pass through our lives without ever knowing they have made a difference. In the early 1960s, a young girl named Kathy Williams lived in a horrifying world of emotional and physical abuse. But when all seemed lost, a man she had never met before and has never seen since helped change her life forever. Mary, Mac, 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 black, 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 July 1961. The streets of Chicago's South Side echo with the carefree laughter of children. But far removed from the delightful sounds of summer, a hidden crime has been committed. One young girl has been stripped of her innocence. The night before, 14-year-old Kathy Williams was forced to participate in a drunken party and then fell prey to the abusive sexual advances of her stepfather, Clifford Starks. I awoke in the middle of Clifford's bed with Clifford actually laying almost on top of me. He was naked. I was totally naked. I remembered his hands being all over my breast. Well, I knew that that was wrong, and I didn't know what else had happened. I couldn't remember, and so that scared me, too. So, and that's why I took off, I wrote the letter, and I thought that would be the end of it in a child's mind. I'm thinking, well, you know, this will take care of everything. I can get out of here. I'll be saved. <laughs> the events of the previous evening were the culmination of months of horror for Kathy Williams. She felt she had no choice but to run away. But with nowhere to go, Kathy was soon picked up off the streets by her stepfather. She was beaten and held prisoner in a relative's apartment, locked into a small room for more than a week. Let me out! Kathy Williams was trapped in a horrible but all too familiar tragedy. Compounding her dilemma was the fact that her stepfather was a respected detective in the Chicago Police Department. In desperation, <laughs> Kathy reluctantly went to the police. What is your name? I don't know. Where do you live? Kathy devised an elaborate scheme well, in which she pretended to have is? amnesia. If all went as planned, her stepfather would never learn of her visit, and Kathy would be sent somewhere else to live. So we just had to put her down as a Jane Doe. And I'm thinking, God, good, they'll put take me someplace. Because anything was better than going back to that hell hole that I had run away from. Are you having problems at home? Well, if you are having problems at home, running away is not going to solve them. Do you have brothers and sisters? If you have brothers and sisters and you are having problems, they could be going through the same thing you're going through. So help Finally, me. Kathy decided to tell the truth and hope for the best. My stepfather has been molesting me. <laughs> he moved. And she said, you poor child. She said, we'll do anything and everything we can to help you. Everybody was empathetic. But for some reason, I felt like this was the police. Maybe they really could help me. 
and I felt that I had two younger sisters there that they didn't need to be there and, and the same thing could happen to them because I hadn't thought about that. Kathy's optimism was quickly shattered. Just as she had feared, her stepfather was notified. Sergeant? Detective Clifford Starks, what brings you to the 7th? Come to pick up my daughter. Your daughter? What's she doing here? Kathy Williams. Get her down here. Once Clifford came down to the police station and flipped out his badge, that was the end of me. Kathy Williams. She's Detective Clifford Stark's daughter, and he's come to take her home. He became omnipotent, and I became a pile of nothing. She doesn't want to go home with you. She doesn't want to go home with me and lock her up. I knew if I went home with them, I was dead meat. Lock her up, officer. And I refused, and upon refusal to go home with them, I was then shackled with handcuffs and thrown into the back of a paddy wagon like a common criminal and taken off to the county jail. Kathy says that she was labeled incorrigible according to existing Illinois state law. She spent one night in jail and was then remanded to a city home for delinquent minors. Maisie, I'm so scared. I don't want to go Four months later, stuff. Kathy appeared at a hearing in juvenile court. Many of her closest friends from the neighborhood oh, gathered, prepared to people. testify on her behalf. Kathy Williams, would you come with me, please? I'm sorry, this is a juvenile court proceeding and is limited to the immediate members of the family. You'll have to wait out here. Kathy Williams? Yes, sir, Your Honor. Please take your seat. Kathy remembers that as the proceedings began, it was discovered that her case file had conveniently disappeared. Counselor. The file contained affidavits supporting her allegations of sexual abuse. Once again, it seemed that Clifford Starks had stacked the deck against his stepdaughter. We seem to have a blank file here. Your Honor, this is Detective Sergeant Starks. This is Kathy's father. The judge's decision was based solely upon the testimony of Clifford Starks that day, that moment in the courtroom. She stays out late at night if she comes home at all. She runs with a bad group of kids. Clifford told them that they had had all kinds of trouble with me, that I was, quote, unquote, an incorrigible, runaway teenager, prostitute, in fact, said I was into drugs. Ms. Williams, please rise. It's the order of this court that you be confined to the Illinois State Training School for Girls at Geneva until your 18th birthday. My feelings were, the, it was the end of the world. I, I was, I, I didn't know I could feel that kind of pain or that, that much hurt. Each time you think it's bad, you just think it, it just couldn't get worse, but it gets worse. And when you look over at your family and friends, it's like, now it's, it's proven that I'm, I'm wrong. You know, obviously this wouldn't happen if I wasn't bad, and maybe I did deserve this. Kathy was placed in the custody of a Cook County deputy sheriff to be transported to reform school. She had no idea that this ride would become a remarkable turn of fortune. When they put me in the back of that paddy wagon, I just started boohooing. I just got to, th it dawned on me then, nobody knows where I'm going. I don't know where I'm going. You know, this, this has to be hell. I didn't do anything she wrong. Did. Yeah, I, I heard that story it. before. <laughs> Alone and scared to death, Kathy began to blurt out her story to the deputy. I'm here because my stepfather was messing with me. Your stepfather? Yes, he was messing with me. Messing with you how? Touching me the way a man touches a woman. By the time they arrived at the reform school, the deputy was convinced that the system had made a terrible mistake. Kathy was obviously being punished for being a victim. The deputy risked his own job by offering to help. But something about what you said and the way you said it makes me believe. And I'd like to check it out for you. Who was that you said you wanted me to call? Or... I didn't know if I could believe him in that. I mean, I had believed everybody else, and I still was on my way to Geneva. So, some, but something in my heart wanted me to believe him. It was something kind in his eyes I saw in that mirror, and I said, maybe he would be the one that could do something. I didn't know. I just didn't have any idea. John Toomey. Tennessee. The unknown deputy was true to his word. They you down Seven there? weeks later, Kathy was taken to the state building in yeah, downtown Chicago for an interview with a social worker. 
But Kathy, I can't make you any promises, but we're going to try and help you. Now, when you took that paddy wagon ride down to Geneva, you talked to the sheriff who was driving, didn't you? You gave him some names. I don't know what you said to him, but whatever it was, it must have been pretty convincing. He came over here and he talked to me and... Uh, a deputy had contacted Kathy's friends and put them in touch with the proper authorities. He talked to Mother Gordon. Some had even signed affidavits corroborating Kathy's accusations against her stepfather. Look, from everything we've been able to find out, it looks like you're in the wrong place. You got a raw deal. He says, it looks to me like you were railroaded. He said, in according to everything I have in front of me, you were. He says, so I want you to go back there, keep your nose clean, stay out of trouble, and we'll be back in touch. And I thanked him, but knowing that, the, hey, this is just another bubble, and it was going to pop and float on off into the sunset like the rest. But this time, the system worked. Two weeks later, Kathy Williams was released from the reformatory. Ultimately, she was declared an emancipated minor and went to live with friends in the neighborhood. It was just like New Year's, you know, counting down for the clock. You know, it was just a very happy, happy time. I was finally getting to go home with my new mother and father and my new sister, so it was a joyous occasion. <laughs> Kathy Williams was fortunate. She flourished in her new family and started a church group which offers counseling to abused children. But Kathy has never forgotten the unknown deputy who lent a helping hand when no one else would. Like Every girl, I guess, in, in the fairy tales wants a prince on a, on a horse or a knight in shining armor, and he'd be my knight in the paddy wagon. And if I, if I could find him, I just want to say to him that many people reach out for help, and many are refused help. But because of the fact that I reached out to him, and he acknowledged me and gave me the help that I needed, he gave me my life. He gave me not only my life, my, I have a, a healthy son who's here. I've touched other people's lives in many ways. And if it had not been for him, none of that would have happened. Turn. The bizarre disappearance of a woman in Florida culminates in murder. On Thursday, July 19, 1990, Jane McGowan of Boca Raton, Florida, received a disturbing letter from her 34-year-old sister, Beverly. The handwritten note had been postmarked a day earlier I've got to make some major changes in my life. I quit my job, sold the condo and furniture, and I'm leaving for a while. The following day, Jane and Beverly's brother Steve received a similar letter from Beverly. Something bothered me because that's not the type of person that, that Bev was. She was not the kind of person, after spending all her money to try to get that condo and try to you know, land the job at the bank, which she was, seemed to be happy with, it was not her nature to just give, out, give up on everything and just walk away from it. That evening, Steve and Jane went to Beverly's condo. Beth? Her car was gone, her phone had been disconnected, and she had not been seen at work for two days. There was her nightgown laying next to the bed. Uh, the bed wasn't made. I mean, it just looked like, you know, she'd gone out for the day and had every intention of coming back that night. It appeared as if Beverly had indeed decided just to go off and start over. All she took with her were her two cats, her address book, birth certificate, and passport. Steve and Jane McGowan were completely baffled by their sister's sudden decision to walk away from her family and her life. The day after she was last seen, Beverly sent a telegram to her mortgage company, authorizing them to foreclose on her condo and dispose of her personal belongings. In several letters to family and friends, Beverly offered no explanations. To her brother Steve, she wrote simply, I just want to say goodbye to you and the kids and let you know that what I'm doing is the right thing. The type of person that, that Bev was, 
She had two different sides to her. Her first side was her private side, which I know she enjoyed her privacy a tremendous amount. Her second side was the side that she showed when she was with myself, my sister, and my, my family. And that was just a fun-loving person, just somebody who was out to enjoy themselves as much as they possibly could. In 1987, Beverly McGowan began a promising career in the loan department of a Fort Lauderdale bank. Within two years, she was able to purchase a modest condo nearby Pompano Beach. The week before her disappearance, Beverly began advertising for a roommate. Bev came in one morning and said that she had advertised for a roommate and that this woman, Alice, was going to be moving in, and approximately, I think it was the following Friday. And she just thought this woman was incredibly nice. It was going to be great. Oh, They clicked. That's the way she felt. Now, as I was explaining to you, your life path number is your birth date. Beverly told Cindy that Alice was English. She drove a nice car and seemed to be a successful career woman. Moreover, she and Beverly shared a common interest in the New Age movement, especially numerology. Now, this personal year number is four. That shows that you are at a crossroads in your life. She had asked Bev for some numbers that pertain to her life so that she could do a chart for her. And Bev gave her some numbers, not anything real serious, not real personal. And she did an initial chart and then came back and said, I need more information at which point Bev volunteered her passport numbers, numbers on her birth certificate. Well, the first adjustment I see is a long trip. Apparently, Alice going, told Beverly that she would find true romance and accumulate time. great wealth. And you'll be doing a lot of traveling. But she did predict a dark cloud on the horizon. But there is a gray area that I must tell you about, Beverly. It involves a couple, a man and a woman. They are related, but I don't know if they're married. They're very close to you, and they're going to deceive you. They're going to hurt you. Well, you how? I don't know how. I just know that they're close to you, and you need to be aware. Don't be wrong. Thursday, July 19th, two days after Beverly was last seen. At 5.30 p.m., the mutilated body of a woman was found at the edge of a drainage canal in St. Lucie County, 100 miles from Pompano Beach. The victim's head had been crudely decapitated. Only a portion of the lower jaw and five teeth remained. Her hands had been severed, her throat slit, and part of her abdomen cut away, apparently to remove a tattoo. We assume that uh, whoever committed the murder uh, was trying to conceal her identity. It was probably one of the most gruesome uh, homicides that uh, our agency has investigated in recent years. The only solid clue to the victim's identity had been overlooked by the killer. A small tattoo of a yellow rose on her right ankle. Beverly McGowan had just such a tattoo. Four days later, dental records provided positive identification. The dead woman was Beverly Ann McGowan. We found nothing in her background that would indicate that uh, she was any type, in any type of trouble or was involved in anything illegal. The authorities in Beverly's family were especially baffled by her letters. They were all in her handwriting, and there was no indication that she had been coerced into sending them. Investigators immediately searched Beverly's condo, looking for something, anything, tying Beverly's apparent decision to leave with her murder. They found a notepad with a list of names and phone numbers of people who had called about the ad for a roommate. Only the last notation did not check out. It read Alice, Tuesday, 6.30. No last name, no phone number. Alice was supposed to be on loan to the United States from England, working for IBM in, in South Florida. Upon checking with uh, the IBM Corporation, we learned that they had nobody on loan to South Florida from England, and that the office that Alice said she worked for in Fort Lauderdale, that they didn't even have an office in Fort Lauderdale. 
Hi. Hi. I'd like to get this, please. Sure. Will it be cash or charge? It's going to be a charge. Investigators soon discovered that on the day Beverly's body was found, a woman fitting Alice's description used Beverly's Visa card to make purchases at several shops in the area. The day before, someone had used the card to withdraw $300 from an automatic teller machine. On Friday, July 20th, the day after the body was discovered, the case took another bizarre twist. Someone used the same credit card in North Miami to reserve a rental car at London's Heathrow Airport. Hello there. Can I help you? Yes, I'd like to buy a car rental voucher for London Heathrow Airport, please. Do you have a credit card? Yes, I do. The travel agent described this person as a very masculine-looking female that to them appeared to be a male wearing a cheap black Cleopatra wig. Taxes in London these days are so expensive. Yes, I She also described her as having a British accent and a person that was appeared to be very familiar with the Heathrow area in London, England. The man told the travel agent that he was flying to London on British Airways Flight 292, which was scheduled to depart on Sunday evening at 6.30 p.m. We checked the manifest for that particular flight and other airlines that were traveling to London on that particular day. Nowhere on any of the manifests did we see the name of Beverly Ann McGowan. On Monday, July 23rd, a person wearing a cheap-looking wig and posing as Beverly McGowan did indeed pick up a car at Heathrow Airport. Two days later, Beverly's car was found at a motel near Miami International Airport. It had been there for at least five days. Investigators found only one significant clue. Hey, Dave, take a look at this. Four strands of black synthetic wig hair. The mystery surrounding Beverly McGowan's death reverberates with a single word, why? It seems obvious that Beverly was a victim of a scam, but it was a scam which only netted the perpetrators $1,000. Why would anyone commit such a vicious murder for so little money? Why did they go to such lengths to conceal the victim's identity? And why did they choose Beverly McGowan? The most puzzling part about it is the lack of motive. Um, the, the savage nature in which the body was decapitated and the pains that they went through trying to conceal her identity isn't that of your normal, uh, everyday uh, domestic killing. I try to think about the people that Bev worked for, uh, her friends, her relationships. Uh, what kind of person would, would be involved with a, with a murder like this? Why somebody would come into to my sister's life and for a measly thousand dollars, just take it. You know, it doesn't make any sense to me. In 1985, Sally Garrity of San Francisco, California, faced an all too common dilemma. She was looking to settle down, but had not yet found the man of her dreams. Oh, excuse me. Then in February of that year, at a neighborhood no, tavern, Sally like thought she had met the perfect mate, a young man named Sal right. Guardado. I'll rack and you break. What's your name, anyway? Sally, what's yours? Sal, Sal Guardado. Sal, Sally, that's neat. She said, I think I met Mr. Wright, Sherry. 
So I was very happy for her to have a good, meet someone that would make her happy. And I seen that in her face, that Sal had made her happy by just the short time that she had met him and known him. Sally Gerdy was half Irish, half Shoshone Paiute Indian. She and her sister Sherry were raised by their Aunt Lydia in San Francisco. Sally had been trained as a bookkeeper, but was making and selling Native American handicrafts when she met Sal. Sal worked part-time in a local pizza parlor where Sally brought her family to meet him. Hey, hi, hi Sally. How you doing? I'm great. Good to see you. Hi. This is my sister Sherry. Hi, nice Sherry. To meet you. And this is my auntie Lydia. Hi, Lydia. Sal. How are you doing? <laughs> Sally was really glowing. When she introduced me, she was so happy. And she said, did you see his car? Do you see him? He has a job. And she, her expression and her glowing was so over, just overpowering that she was so happy. The romance proceeded at a whirlwind pace. Within a week, Sal proposed and took out a loan for a diamond ring. But it wasn't long before the relationship began to change. Sal lost his job in his car, and the couple was forced to move in with Sally's Aunt Lydia. It became obvious that there was another side to Sal that had been hidden until now. This place is a dump. So get a job. Shut up. He grew surly and refused to do anything but watch television and go bowling with his friends. Big words from a big man. Three weeks later, when they visited a Native American festival 30 miles from San Francisco, Sally's sister Sherry got a first-hand look at Sal's darker side. He's in a bad mood today. God, I can't take him. I hate him. I don't want to be with him anymore. And he just Sally didn't seem very happy that day. That was the first indication to me that she wasn't happy with him. So do you want to tell her? Just forget about it, Sal. It's not going to work out. What's the matter? What are you talking about? Sal doesn't want to take the train back to San Francisco. He wants to borrow your van instead. Oh, I'm sorry, Sal. You can't take it. What is the problem? We need the van, so we'll just take it. Sal, it's not mine. I just borrowed it for the day. I have to get it back. Don't give me that lie. Where are the keys? It's not a huh? lie. You can't take it. Shut up and give me the keys. I don't want to listen to all your lying excuses. Come on, Sal. Leave her What's alone. What's a few miles on this heap anyway? That was a big change from the pizza parlor. She, uh indicated to me that she wished he would leave and that he would move out. On May 23, 1985, three months after meeting Sally, Sal Guardado waited for her to come home. When he noticed that a young man had given her a ride, Sal became uncontrollable. Just drop it, will you, Sal? I already told you I didn't do anything. I know what you were doing. I could see you in the car. He's a friend. He gave me a ride home. Why Sally's Aunt Lydia returned right in the middle of the argument. Hello, I'm home. Oh, I just hated There's him. A big deal, you slut. He was very aggressive. He might have got jealous, yes. But there's nothing between the man and Sally. She just rode home with him. Lydia, I need you to go to the store for me. I need some smokes. OK, Sal. Here's some money. I need them right away. OK. He never asked me to do anything for him. He just wanted me out of the house that day. When I think about it, that's what I think that's what he wanted me out. Your cigarettes here. 30 minutes Sally? later, Lydia returned. Sally? Sal? I didn't see anything when I came back. It was so quiet. Then the TV was on, so I just sat down on the day bed and thought, well, I better watch the news, because it was coming on. I heard the bedroom door open, and I didn't hear nothing else. I just kept watching the news. He 
he'd try to strangle me. I wouldn't let him, I'd start fighting him. Before I know it, I got hit on the head. I heard the bones crushing and the ball roll over or something. You know, like you could hear that bowling ball roll in the lanes, how it sounds. That's what I heard. But I was out. In sports, the National Hockey Sally. After about 45 minutes, Sally. Lydia regained consciousness. When I came to, I got up and I was so weak, I was just staggering around. And then I went in the bedroom. My niece was laying there. I knew right away she was dead. And after that, I just went to my neighbor and told, knocked on the window and told her to call the police. I was hurt. OK, take it away. Sally Garrity had been strangled to death, possibly with a cat leash or telephone cord. Lydia Henry had suffered a concussion and lacerations. During the investigation, Sally's family discovered that Sal Guardado was a convicted felon with a long criminal record. He had spent five years in prison for arson and attempted murder. The intended victim was a former girlfriend. Authorities immediately began combing the San Francisco area. They received reports that Sal might have left the country and disappeared in Mexico. We thought we'd uh, solve this case right away. We had the FBI involved. We had local law enforcement involved. Uh, we had all the tools, and uh, we just couldn't uh, find out where he'd gone or where he was. It boggles the mind to understand how we avoided this all this time, some seven years. In the Native American beliefs, our culture, we believe that if someone's life is taken before they're ready, their spirit can't rest until justice is served. So Sally's spirit, we believe, isn't at rest until Sal's will be caught and put to justice. Three months after Sal Guardado disappeared, a witness reported seeing him back in San Francisco at a fast food restaurant. However, authorities now believe he may be in Miami, Mexico, Hawaii, or Puerto Rico. Guardado is currently wanted on charges of murder, attempted murder, and assault with a deadly weapon. Salvador Nunez Guardado is 5 feet 10 inches tall and weighs 210 pounds. He has black hair, brown eyes, and a tattoo of a heart and arrow with the name Rachel on his upper right arm. He is of Mexican descent. In 1989, two Belgian national policemen had a shocking encounter with a strange, brilliantly lit object. Since that time, thousands of ordinary citizens have reported similar sightings, and incredibly, the Belgian Air Force has recorded on radar an unidentified flying object. In 1969, Rock Creek, Ohio was terrorized by a gang of street toughs. When Robert Hamrick took over the police force, he was determined to clean up the town. Just eight months later, Amrick died in a mysterious car accident. His family is convinced he was murdered. And thanks to our viewers, a woman in Tennessee has finally found her natural mother. Join me for their heartwarming reunion next time on Unsolved Mysteries. Thank you.